With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohoo! A hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18. Plus. Athletics is back. Records are being broken. More than a million people watched the British Championships on a Friday night on BBC Two. And there's a new Olympic head coach at British Athletics in former World, European and Commonwealth medalist Christian Malcolm. As new CEO Joanna Coates completes her top team to move the sport forward. I'm John. And I'm Michael. But most of the top names were missing in Manchester, competing elsewhere. Athletics' current TV deal with the BBC is at an end. And will there be the prestigious Diamond League meetings here in the UK next year? The challenges continue. They come thick and fast for Coates and her team. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic podcast. All that to come, as well as medal success for British triathletes and sailors this week. And the Olympics will go ahead next year. But maybe, just maybe, without the USA. Well, all that to come. And as always, you can get in touch any time. You can find us on Twitter at anything but F, or you can message us on Instagram or on Facebook. You can go to our website, send us a message there, anythingbutfooty.com, or you can email us, anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. British athletics return to action for the first time since lockdown, with the British Championships in Manchester for the first time since 2007. It was a cold and dark night on a Friday, but 1.4 million people tuned in on BBC Two, and there were some great performances from Harry Koppel, who broke the British record in the pole vault, Holly Bradshaw winning her eighth women's title in the pole vault, Sophie McKinnor set a stadium record in the shot put, Daniel Rowden upset James Jake Whiteman to win the men's 800 metres title and Amy Pratt set a world lead championship and stadium record en route to the women's 3,000 metre steeplechase. You can get all the results in our flash briefings, the Anything But Footy flash briefings, which you can download on Apple, on Google, or you can say, Alexa, give me the latest news from Anything But Footy. So find out more about that. But where was Katerina Johnson-Thompson, Laura Muir and Mo Farah, Michael? And others, of course, missing. There's 78 British athletes on the world-class programme. And I counted, I think, about a dozen who actually turned up for the British Championships. In answer to your question, well, Laura Muir was in action, along with Gemma Riki, who were both hotly tipped, of course, to win Olympic medals in 2021. In Marseille and then in Poland, Katrina Johnson-Thompson, she was in Belgium competing in the Diamond League. A couple of seasons best, but let's remember it's been a strange season. So when we hear about seasons best and, you know, records, it's, it's not a like-for-like like comparison to other years. And Mo Farah, well, he was in Brussels also at the Diamond League where he's actually set his first ever world record it's a world one hour record which is not a record we talk about very much but basically in exactly 60 minutes Mo Farah four times Olympic champion six times uh, world champion of course now beat Heidi Gabri Selassie's record by 45 meters in exactly 60 meter- minutes he ran 21.33 kilometers and it would have been sweet for him I think because as we know he's had a bit of beef over the years with Haile Gabri Selassie hasn't he 
<laughs> the odd disagreement here and there. And that's his first ever world record. You listed all his other achievements, but his first ever world record. But does it matter that these guys, the big names, in inverted commas, weren't in Manchester, weren't winning British Championship titles? Yes, I think it does matter. And I think the reason it matters is because of the situation that British athletics find themselves in at the moment. They're at the end of their current TV deal with the BBC. Now, the BBC showed those championships as part of that deal. They got good numbers, as we mentioned right at the start. 1.4 million people watching on Friday night, then again on Saturday afternoon. Helped, I think, by the scheduling of the event and British athletics haven't always helped themselves with scheduling that that big event at the London Stadium which they put up against the Wimbledon final and the Cricket World Cup final so they were never going to get huge audience figures or indeed ticket sales for that and on Friday night they were up against early Carabao Cup action and they were up against sort of fairly meaningless international friendly football on the Saturday afternoon so good scheduling But what I would say is British athletics are very lucky in this TV deal that's worth around about £2 million that they have with British athletics. Because you look at British swimming, British rowing, British cycling, British gymnastics, for example, none of them have their domestic championships being shown on television. Yes, the world championships, the European championships, or maybe in terms of the cycling, the the Grand Prix season, uh, the World Series, they come up. Uh, but they don't get their domestic championship shown. And athletics is pretty unique in that, in that its domestic championships get shown indoors and outdoors. But if Dina Asher smith Katarina Johnson-Thompson, Gemma Riki, Laura Muir and Mo Farah don't want to come, the BBC are not going to continue to hand five, six hours of, of primetime television coverage across to it. And for the athletes, they need profile, they need coverage, their sponsors want them on BBC One, on on BBC Two as well. But in this season of all seasons, they've had to go and chase the money, which is the Diamond League meetings and the other meetings I told you about in Europe. And that's why they didn't appear at the British Championships. If that pattern continues, then I think we've got a big problem. But I don't think it will, to be fair to the athletes. You're you're right, they, they needed the money. And I think you can't argue that being locked down, literally locked down, not doing training for a number of weeks, were they? They weren't even allowed to do that. They needed to get out there, and some of them have put that ahead of a British title. Others haven't, and I've, we'll, we'll go through the list in a moment and just talk about them. But, you know, they are funded by British Athletics, as you say, the National Lottery, but they do need to earn race money elsewhere. And it, it, it is a different year. It's it's a different year. It's a crazy year. It's not going to happen again because World Athletics have protected, they've come out and said that they're going to protect the national championships from next year. So there'll be no Diamond League meetings. There'll be no other uh, athletics meetings during a fortnight period where every Everybody can have those championships. So then, of course, you've got an Olympics to qualify for as well yeah. with the with the British Championships, which this year, of course, we didn't have. Yeah, and that's where British athletics need to be strong because if they're going to start handing out free passes to the teams for Olympics for World Championships, which they have been accused and guilty of in the past to some of the bigger names, you don't need to come to the national championships. We'll still put you in the team. They need to be strong because if they're going to hand out free passes, if they're going to say quietly to Katarina Johnson-Thompson or Dina Asher-Smith, you don't need to come to the national championships, then they probably won't if their coaches, their strength and conditioning team suggest that actually they might be better off staying away if they can still get in the team. I think it's it's the beginning, potentially, of a slippery slope. But as we both said, kind of all bets are off this year. I think anything's forgivable. But it has been not just this year. It has been something we've seen over the years uh, at the British Championships. One, it's, it's struggled to attract an attendance, certainly when it's in Birmingham. I know it was behind closed doors in Manchester, but with the, the sound effects added, the atmosphere was actually better, I think, at times <laughs> with the crowdies than some of those Birmingham Championships that both you and I have actually been to and attended when there's been paying spectators in there. I do think the the British Championships maybe needs to look at. It was interesting hearing Joanna Coates, the new chief executive, speaking about some of her priorities afterwards. She talked about events. And, you know, we go back to that viewing figure on the Friday night of, of 1.4 mm. million. That is, that is more than BBC One and yeah. ITV. And, I, and, it, and it was because I think people like, and the people of, of our generation, our age, 
like watching athletics on a Friday night. It's how we, we were brought up. We were brought up to watch athletics on a Friday night underneath floodlights. Now, you look back at Doha and the World Championships, much criticised, of course, for lack of ticket sales and all the rest of it. But the staging of it was phenomenal. If you could do a British Championships on a Friday night and then maybe create something on the, the Saturday night, a bit like the night of the 10K PBs that we went to in Highgate, where you've got some atmosphere, you've got a bit of a light show, you've got fireworks at the end, then suddenly that is more than just a British Championships. It's a spectacle that people will want to watch and attend. And those are the two mm. income streams that British athletics need to protect at the moment, and that is the income stream from broadcasters and the income stream from ticket sales, and they've not had that this year. So you mentioned about 78 athletes get funding. Uh, 16 of them are on what they call the Olympic podium. So these are the people who they expect to be on the podium at the Olympic Games. Ambitious. And out of those out of those 16, four of them competed. Four! Just count it. One, two, three, four. So big up Holly Bradshaw, who we mentioned, pole vault champion. Abigail Urizuru. The long jump. She finished second. She was the defending t- champion. She came back to do it, but she finished second behind Jazz Sawyers, who returned to victory after four years. Jake Whiteman, who I think everyone thought was going to win the 800 metres, but was beaten by Daniel Rowden, as we mentioned. And Sophie McKinna, who's just come on to that podium. Last year, she decided not to take the funding, but obviously with lockdown, she's changed that and she came back and defended her shot put title. But Dina Asher-Smith hasn't returned to racing, so I wouldn't have expected her to be there. She, she's not competing anywhere. Tom Bosworth, had COVID in March. He, he's ended his season. Didn't expect him to be there. Mo Farah. I mean, we've we've seen Mo at the British Championships before, but as you mentioned, he wanted that world record in Brussels. Understandable, maybe. I don't know. Katerina Johnson-Thompson. Here was an interesting quote from her, and there are, there are others that I wanted to highlight, but she said that the World Hathathon champion, don't forget, saying in Brussels, where she competed in the hurdles and the high jump, this was effectively, quote, the highlight of her season. It, 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 that's slightly wrong. It shouldn't. It shouldn't have been, should it? She should have been maybe at the British Championships. Yeah, but I think if if there'd been a heptathlon potentially for her to compete in, then that might maybe have have been something that that changed her mind. But you've got to look, and with all due respect to to all those British champions that were forty odd of them that were 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 named over the weekend, you've got to look at, at the kind of people and where they are in their careers. And what they've done, and you know, there were so many teenagers promising performances. People like Keely Hodgson, eighteen years of age, winning the, the women's eight hundred meters. Hannah Williams, of course, in the two hundred meters. Sister of Jody, who was the champion. I was going to say twelve months ago, but it's probably fourteen, fifteen months ago now. You, you, <laughs> with all due respect to all those people I, I've just named. They're not in the calibre of Katerina Johnson Thompson. So aside from the fact that, you know, as a world champion with the the economic pulling power that that that, that brings, so she can go and, and run on the circuit or jump on the circuit rather in Europe. Also, what was the point of her coming to Manchester? Um, as we know, she's, she's based herself in France for, for a considerable amount mm-hmm. of time relatively recently as well. So I don't know. There could have been travel and quarantine considerations in that as well. But what was the point of her coming and taking part in you know, what she probably considered to be fairly substandard competitions at the British Championship? Apart from you're supporting your national governing body and supporting their broadcasting deals and I think that is the bigger problem for Joanna Coates and you you mentioned it earlier where I think she's you know she said to us in our great British bosses podcast that she wants to put athletes first because she felt like the organization hadn't done that or that was the feedback that she got from athletes that they aren't seen as the priority and I think if you feel like you're the priority you might then want to give something back to British Athletics and British Championships. So that's maybe why KJT didn't do it. Laura Muir uh, won in Poland on Sunday, the 1500 metres. She's had three wins in a row. You know, she's had a lot of backing from British Athletics. Um, Lots of events have been run with her trying to break records and stuff. Question why, why Poland? But okay, that was the decision. At least you're, at least you're out there representing Britain and competing. A few that I've absolutely no idea. I couldn't find any idea where these people are. Sophie Hitchin, Zarnell Hughes, Nick Miller, Reese Prescott, Lorraine Ugan, just I can't find them. They're on this podium list, but no idea why they were not competing at the British Championships or what they were doing. And this is another one of Joanna Coach's challenges because she's come from netball, which is a team sport. 
And she's now going to try and bring in, as she said to us in that Great British Bosses interview that we did relatively recently, she's now got to try and bring in some of these traits from a team sport into British athletics, which operates very much in silos. So you will have a throwing silo, you will have a jumping silo, a sprint, a middle distance, a long distance, a relay um, silo as well. For the likes of Katarina Johnson-Thompson and Laura Muir, they're individual athletes working with probably an individual coach and a very, very small team around them. They are funded by British Athletics and it would be great if they could come together at a British Championships, you know, the, the creme de la creme of British Athletics, the, the top names that we've spoken about, it would be great. But at the end of the day, they are individuals who have individual challenges, individual aspirations, individual dreams for 2021. And they will make selfish decisions based on that. And that is another one of those challenges for Joanna Coates. How do you galvanize people with very, very differing pursuits very very differing disciplines and coaches with very very differing thoughts into one team and bring them together to create that product and i hate to use the word but that is what they'll be talking about in broadcast circles at the minute a product that sky or itv or channel 4 channel 5 or maybe an extension with the bbc a product that they will want to show Well, I want to talk about broadcasting and coaching, but this is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic podcast. Still to come, as well as more on the British Championships, triathlon, sailing, the London Marathon and the Maldives. That's all to come. Christian Malcolm, then. He's the new head or Olympic head coach is the new title. Working with Sarah Symington, who's the new, of course, director of performance, performance director. The right appointment, Christian Malcolm, World European Commonwealth medalist, did it with uh, Athletics Australia as well, head of coaching there. Yeah, he's not someone I know um, particularly well. Uh, I think we've, we've probably met on a couple of occasions. So it's not someone that I can speak about from personal experience. I do know some people that are pretty close to him, though, and they are made up with the appointment. You know, they think it's a it's an excellent appointment. I think he's he's probably come into the frame initially is one of the outsiders. When you look at such high-profile figures like Tony Minicello, uh, for example, who was also sort of named as, as being a potential appointment here. I think Christian Malcolm, who you know back in 2017 was part of the coaching team for the relays, of course, as far as British athletics was concerned. Let's remember, of course, those relay teams did help British athletics meet their medal target at the World Champions in 2017. Four medals, didn't yeah, they win? Four, four out of medals. four, and they just, they just got that, that target as well. Went away to Australia, um, has, has done a lot out there and got some experience under his belt. Has that relatively recent experience of being a competitor and an athlete as well, going back to what we, we've said about putting athletes first and engaging with athletes. He will know, of course, what it's like to be in that position. Joanna Coates has described him as, as young and visionary. He seems to have been welcomed by by the current squad of athletes. Dina Asher-Smith tweeted simply, new era. And I think that's important because if Joanna Coates, who's taken over what has been a failing organisation, who have had this investigation by UK Sport, who basically said they couldn't get any worse, if she's trying to change the 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 perception of the organisation, she's trying to change the direction of travel of the organisation, Sarah Symington's an appointment that she knows from netball and then christian malcolm will slot in alongside paula dunn who will do the equivalent role uh, for the paralympic team as well it does seem like a new broom doesn't it It does seem like a new era and you know from everything i've i've read and and seen on social media christian malcolm's appointment does seem to have been fairly universally welcomed i'm not sure what the conversation was around the minicello breakfast table having said that (laughs) Uh, Good luck to Christian and all, of course, at British Athletics, as you mentioned there. Joe, Anna Coates, Sarah Symington, Christian Malcolm, all coming in. uh, Working with Paula Dunn, of course, head of Paralympic as well. Um, It's going to be an interesting uh, few months, years, hopefully, as well, because I think you've got to give them time. You can't can't expect to turn it around immediately. We've got to not not have the mentality of a football supporter and say, I want instant success and why is this not happening and that kind of thing. We've got to be more Sir Alex Ferguson about it and allow them to come in and change the culture and change the way that the organisation works and coaches and then we'll see the benefit of it. Because I think what we've seen, Michael, 
And everyone says London 2012, or where was the legacy part of that? That British Championships, I sat and watched it on Friday night. I know you sat and watched it on Saturday afternoon. The finals were full of 17, 18, 19-year-olds. You've mentioned some of them already. Amy Hunt was second in the women's 800 metres. She's an 18-year-old. She won the British Indoor title earlier this year. That is legacy from 2012. She would have been 10 eight years ago. You know... We've talked about it on this podcast. LA Games, we were 10. We were 8, 9, 10. That was the moment that we realised the Olympics was special. And you you've look at that, those finals and you think there is legacy in this sport and there is hope for this sport. And I think people need to realise that people still want to be the best. They want to be quick. They want to jump high. They want to throw far. They want to be the best in Britain and they want to go and compete against the best in the world. I find it very hard to disagree with anything you've said there other than the fact if we were really truly inspired by LA 84, you'd have seen us both lining up in the British Athletics Championships in 1992, which clearly didn't happen. Final point, though, I'd just say about Joanna Coates. I think she, she said something helpful and something unhelpful across the weekend. Going back to your analogy of the football coach, she said that Christian Malcolm could be their Pep Guardiola. I think Ooh, yeah. I think that is putting huge pressure on Christian Malcolm. But then on the Saturday when she did her interview uh, on the BBC Red Button or whatever they call it these days with, with Gabby Logan and Denise Lewis, she said that Christian Malcolm was a long-term appointment. She said there wasn't much that could be done with British athletics between now and, and Tokyo. So don't judge, don't judge the organisation, don't judge the coach on the medal return in 2021. Let's look to, to Paris, perhaps, in 2024. And that goes back to what you're saying. Alex Ferguson, long-term plan, not Pep Guardiola. Quick fix and win. Yeah, and try and buy Messi. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that's never a this good This is anything but throwing. footy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Getting distracted. Uh, Diamond League. So, broadcasting. You mentioned the, big, the BBC red button. What happens if the Athletics isn't on the BBC next year. As you rightly say, their contract has come to an end. But they're now saying, and Joanna Coates again has said this in the interviews over the weekend, that the Diamond League, which has been staged in the last few years in Birmingham, was going to be at Gateshead this year, and of course at the London Anniversary Games, that Diamond League meeting, that prestigious meeting that happens across lots of different places around the world, Monaco and Doha and uh, Oregon, we might not have one in the United Kingdom next year. Yeah, and the Diamond League's been you know, a bit of a, a thorn in the side, if you like, of terrestrial TV and broadcasting because there used to be quite comprehensive um, Diamond League coverage on the BBC. And going back even further to when it was the Golden League, of course, and when there were big nights in, in Oslo and Zurich, uh, going back to, to when we as I've already sort of referenced, were growing up. You know, these were huge events, not just sporting events. They brought the likes of Co, Cram, Avet, Peter Elliott, Tom McKean and others together for these, you know, classic middle distance races. But they were big news. They were on ITV and then they switched to Channel 4, didn't they? The Diamond League, though, in, in more recent times, since the rebranding has had quite extensive BBC coverage. It has, though, I would say, lessened in recent years. You've had to look for it a little bit more. Um, there's been highlights programs on at odd times, the odd Saturday afternoon here from a Diamond League meeting that took place on a Thursday night, for example. <laughs> what the BBC did do and did do very well was they gave comprehensive coverage to the two domestic meetings, as you said, the Birmingham one and then London and the anniversary games. The anniversary games in London, I think, is crucial for British athletics because it is the one weekend a year, the one day a year, where potentially with the right scheduling, as I mentioned, they could sell 50,000 tickets. That puts a few quid in the coffers. The coffers at British Athletics at the moment are not as healthy as they were, and they certainly won't be if they don't sign a new broadcast deal sooner rather than later. So if they were to lose the London Diamond League meeting, I think that would have a, a dramatic impact. And I think that would have a dramatic impact on the, the watching the, the casual athletics fans. We, we know the super fans. We've got the super fans. They can name the personal best. They know split times. They'll tell you what kind of spike someone is wearing. They will always be there. But it's those casual fans that, like you and I, picked it up on a Friday night back in the 80s and 90s. It's those casual fans that will watch the anniversary games one weekend a year or will go and see the anniversary mm. games one weekend a year that would be the huge loss. Because I think, remember, again, in the noughties, when every year came around, 
Formula One would threaten that British Grand Prix would not take place at Silverstone. It was like, we have to not take place at Silverstone. It's not up to speed. It's not up to standard. We're going to withdraw it. And the headlines were full of that. And I wonder whether there's a little bit about that in, in the headlines this week, that the Diamond League may be pulled from from coming to the UK. Obviously, Joanna Coates is going to try and make sure it, it, it stays, and rightly so, particularly the one in London, I agree. Because where else... Michael, does athletics get such large crowds than the anniversary games in London? It's not a sellout. No one's saying it's like the Olympics, but it's still thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Why, if you are Wanda, who who sponsored the Diamond League, would you not want an athletics meeting in that stadium? Why would you pull it from the United Kingdom to have it in an empty Doha? Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And, you know, as well as I do, because we've we've covered anniversary games every year since its inception. The athletes like to come. The likes of Usain Bolt and, and other big names like to come because there is that opportunity, you know, once a year to perform in front of a huge crowd, which they don't always get. I mean, you look recently, there were big crowds in Rio at the Olympics for the athletics. There were minute crowds some nights. There were hardly anyone going some, some sessions in Doha as well. So to come and perform at the Diamond League in London, the anniversary games, is, is a great thing for an athlete. It, it I guess, probably is worth a little bit bit of marginal difference on their their time or their length of jump or throw or whatever in terms of who will pick it up if the bbc don't extend the deal i think it's a neat fit that's sometimes at times a little bit too neat a fit uh, between british athletics and the bbc it's sometimes that the lines are blurred there in terms of who will pick it up channel four do paralympic coverage really well Craig Spence and our great British bosses said they had raised the bar as far as Paralympic coverage is concerned. But they had their fingers burnt when they took the World Championships on and handed the contract back to the BBC. ITV never rule anything out. You know, they picked up horse racing back again after however many decades of hardly doing any horse racing. You know, they took the boat race on, which everyone was very surprised about. So, you know, don't rule it out, but it has to add up for them commercially. And I'm not sure when they can stage Britain's Got Talent or X Factor or The Voice that there's a place for British Championships athletics on ITV. And if they go to Sky, then I think there's an issue then for athletics as a sport and British athletics. And it's interesting, and I can't claim credit for this point because you told it to me, what's cricket done after so many years on, on satellite? They've brought live cricket back to terrestrial TV for the first time in 20 years. Not my point, your point, but it's absolutely right. And I think the BBC would be absolutely crazy to give up the contract, give up the rights in an Olympic year when you're building up to Tokyo with all the stories that come from that. And we know that Tokyo is even more special next year because it was delayed. So you've got that issue. They've got BBC Two where it's a terrestrial TV channel. If ITV pick it up, they're not going to put it on ITV. But even on ITV4 or ITV3 or 2, they're still not going to get the numbers like the BBC would and did on Friday night. And I, you look at those numbers and you think, why would you give it up for such a small um, outlay? And, and, and the, the good um, relationships that you absolutely say may be a bit too close at times, but the good relationships that you have in an Olympic year when you are the Olympic broadcaster. And also they have, as far as I understand it, an ongoing deal with the IAAF for World Championship Athletics. So if they have the World Championships and they have the Olympic Games, it's very difficult for them to build those stories and that narrative over a period of time if they lose the the Diamond League coverage that they have if they lose the British Championships or the Indoor Grand Prix. It would be like them showing the FA Cup final but not showing any Premier League football or FA Cup football during the course of the season. It would be be very difficult. I think you're probably right. There's probably just a bit of brinkmanship happening on the the place of on the side of of both organizations at the minute i would imagine the bbc probably don't want to spend as much as two million anymore but british athletics don't want to lose the support and the coverage they get 
Mm, absolutely. Uh, talking of support and coverage, we've been talking in uh, earlier editions of Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic podcast, that the Nike shoes give you a little bit more extra speed. Uh, we will give a big shout out in this episode, though, to Adidas because Perez Chepchurcha of Kenya broke the women's half marathon in Prague at the weekend and she was running in the new Adidas shoes. And this was kind of our point, Michael, wasn't it? That once you get one shoe that a manufacturer brings out, and yes, it obviously gave some advantage and the new rules have been written and rightly so to keep that in check but the other manufacturers don't want to lose out they want to create shoes that are just as fast it's a shoe race or an arms race and is yeah. it adidas or adidas <laughs> is it nike or nike <laughs> see i think it's nike and adidas, adidas but that's my but i always say nike yeah but, but the, the bigger sometimes. picture you're right you know as one as one shoe manufacturer will develop some technology so the others will will play catch up and you know they'll have their boffins working in the adidas stroke adidas laboratories <laughs> to take on the people working in the nike stroke nike laboratories i always had gola do you remember gola <laughs> Green trainers slash and black primsoles for me <laughs> and i was faster back then than i am now so my pair of reebok classics yeah, my, my Golas did me proud in the school race, 1986, I think when we won the relay. We've named them all now, so we should be accepting uh, boxes of shoes uh, from all of them coming very soon. <laughs> Reebok? No, no. I mentioned Reebok um, Classics. This is... Dunlop. <laughs> <laughs> this is anything but footy the olympic and paralympic podcast uh, we're going to round up some of the other news that has, might not have caught your eye in the world of olympic and paralympic sport in the last week or so the olympics though will be going ahead with or without covid according to the vice president of the international olympic committee i'm not sure they're gonna have much choice to be fair but anyway john coates told the afp news agency the games would start on july 23rd next year come what may he declared the 2020 edition staged in 2021 will become known as the games that conquered covid talk about a headline that you don't ever want to write because you never know what's going to happen he reckons it'll be the light at the end of the tunnel and as we heard from craig spence last week in anything but footy's great british bosses that means the paralympics will be going ahead as well because they do come as a pair i really enjoyed that conversation with craig spence and i think he he spoke a lot of sense around the Paralympics and he didn't give any definitive yes or no on whether he thought they were going to go ahead. He, he spoke very rationally. John Coates, on the other hand, seems to me to be a man with journalists on his speed dial because a simple Google search on that, the games that conquered COVID, reveals that just a couple of months ago he was saying the games weren't going to take place at all. Um, so I think... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I listened to what Craig Spence said about the Paralympics. I accept that if one happens, the others will happen. But the fact that he didn't give any definitive yes or no, I thought said a lot more than John Coates saying it's definitely going to go ahead because John Coates has had a lot to say over the past six months, as a lot of IOC members do often um, over the past six months about whether the games were going to go on and off. And he has been known to change his mind. Let's move it on. Not related to COVID, but could Team USA be banned from the games. That would be good for what? China. It would be good for Team GB as well in terms of medals. The US government, yeah, stay with me, has threatened to withdraw funding for the World Anti-Doping Agency. The US is not happy uh, with how it dealt with the ongoing Russian doping scandal. Going back to that Craig Spence interview, as far as the Paralympics, the IPC are concerned, they're very happy with what Russia are doing now. Team, G Team USA is the biggest contributor to WADA. So Donald Trump's government, I never thought I'd be mentioning Donald Trump on anything but footy, <laughs> thinks that they should have more of a say in governance. And now WADA's fired back with the possibility of saying they're going to leave US athletes out of international events like the Olympics in Tokyo and the Winter Games in Beijing. Presidential election potentially later this year it might be irrelevant by the time it comes around. Who knows? Yeah, certainly a lot of grandstanding uh, going on. What we all uh, probably agree on is that WADA does need to be tough on drug cheats. Yeah. I think that in all seriousness, they do need to be tough on, on drugs cheats. Let's move on to triathlon before we wrap up. Georgia Taylor-Brown is the world triathlon champion. She won the gold medal in Hamburg. The 2019 Leeds triathlon winner came first ahead of Bermuda's Flora Duffy after breaking clear at the start of the run section. British teammate Jess Learmonth uh, finished seventh. Uh, Beth Potter came 21st. Rio bronze medalist Vicky Holland came 31st. In the men's race, Alistair Brownlee, the Olympic champion, was 9th. Alex Yee was the best placed British man in 5th. Johnny Brownlee finished 31st. Uh, Francis Vincent Lewis uh, Louis took gold in that. But what I would say 
around the triathlon, John. It's a difficult decision for the ITU because they contractually had to hold the event. But with travel restrictions, it meant athletes from the likes of Australia, New Zealand, Oceania couldn't travel uh, because there would be quarantine issues, huge costs about then returning home and having to quarantine in like a state-sponsored hotel. I know someone doing that at the moment is costing them around about two, three thousand pounds. So I think with all of that, it wasn't quite the lineup. It's not an asterisk against Georgia Taylor Brown's name, but it probably wasn't the world championship gold that it might have been in another year. To be fair, I really didn't even know it was happening. And I think that probably says a, says a lot as well. And we like to think that we have our eyes on the ball and our finger on the pulse. Uh, Rio gold medalist Giles Scott couldn't quite defend his European Finn title as he returned to action in Poland. Last year's winner came second behind Hungary's jean Bor Berec. Scott is one of the 15 sailors picked for Team, G- Team GB to compete in the Tokyo Olympics because it was delayed by a year and he will be competing next year in Tokyo. Now the Virgin Money London Marathon will be held in a so-called biosecure bubble, which means no current England international footballers will be allowed <laughs> to take part. Football, I stop it. For the historic elite only races which take place next month. Now, the London Marathon is going to take place on a closed loop around St James's Park. There won't be any sort of spectator space or grandstands. And the elite men's race sees marathon world record holder and defending champion Elliot Kipchoge of Kenya going head-to-head with the Ethiopian Kenesina Bekele in the elite women's race. A defending champion and world record holder Bridget Koskai of Kenya will return, as will the two best marathon wheelchair athletes in the world, Daniel Romanchuk of the USA and Manuela Shah of Switzerland. New Olympic sports skateboarding has had a lockdown boom in participation, with GB Skateboarding reporting a massive resurgence hitting the streets. Boards have been selling out across the country, and the organisation's My Skate app, which provides skateboarders with locations of all the skate parks in the UK, has seen an increase of 180,000 users of the app each month. There's also been a big increase in females taking up the sport ahead of its debut at Tokyo 2020 next summer. The Sky Brown effect, perhaps. And in Commonwealth Games news, the Maldives will be competing in Birmingham in 2022 after the South Asian Islands Association was readmitted as a member of the Commonwealth Games Federation. Its government withdrew from the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast in 2016, or the Gold Coast event in 2018. They withdrew from the Federation in 2016 over human rights issues. But the president of the Commonwealth Games Federation, Dame Louise Martin, said it's now a pleasure to see the Maldives return to our family of nations and to work with us to uphold our collective values of humanity, equality and destiny. And let's hope they bid for the Games in the future because 10 days in the Maldives together, John? Uh, I think it could be uh, could be something that we could persuade our work. wives persuade our wives to come with us maybe it's work it's work darling well welcome back to the Maldives and welcome back to British Athletics and the British Championships as well it was great to see athletics back on the TV let's hope that the negotiations will continue to be fruitful and we'll also hope that uh, lockdown continues to be eased and we can see more sport to the like that we saw at the weekend this is anything but footy please do get in touch at any time you can tweet us at anything but f message us on insta or facebook or check out the website www.anythingbutfooty.com sports social podcast network hello it is ryan and i was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com i looked over the person sitting next to me and you know what they were doing they were also playing chumba casino coincidence i think not everybody's loving having fun with it chumba casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime anywhere even at thirty thousand feet so sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus that's chumbacasino.com and live the chumba life no purchase necessary btw void were prohibited by law see terms and conditions 18 plus.